somebody. Come on, somebody. Anybody got victory? Anybody got the victory? Wave your hand if you got the victory. Come on, come on. We ought to thank God for the victory today. Listen. Listen, listen, listen. That's, that's what heaven sounds like. When we all get together and thank God for the victory. Come on, let's, let's pray together. Father, God, we thank you for the victory. God, not only do we have the victory over death, hell, and the grave, but you won every battle. So we have victory even right now. We have victory so we can wave our hands. And we have victory so we can leap for joy. And we have victory so that we can dance. Father, we come before you right now thanking you for the reminder that we've got victory in Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace on this morning. God, thank you that we have a place we can go to to worship and to worship you freely. Father, there's nobody like you. Nobody can do for us what you do for us. And for that, we tell you thank you. Father, we don't have to ask you to come into our service on today because you're already here. We already feel your presence here and we want you to know that you have free reign to rest, rule, and abide right here in this place. Father, now I come before you selfishly asking that you would sit me down so that you might stand up, that you would minimize me so that you might be maximized. In the name of your only son, Jesus, we pray. And we all said together, amen. You may, before you take your seat, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. They're not right. They know I like country church. They're not, they not right at all. Thank God for this music ministry and this joyful choir reminding us we have the victory. Listen, the, the word of the Lord says in Ephesians 3. Do you have it? I'll give you the others time to find it. It's, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. They taught us in children's church, GEP, go eat pizza. So Ephesians is between Galatians and Philippians. Listen, I'm so glad to be before you today. I don't take this lightly. I want to celebrate our senior pastor in his absence, who's getting some much needed rest. I want to thank him for this opportunity and for loving and serving and laboring for us week in and week out. Amen. He has so graciously served the Antioch Church on this weekend, the loss of their senior pastor, Pastor Carrie D. Wesley. And if anybody knows how they feel, it's us. And so we are graciously giving him that opportunity to serve them. And so before you today, before we go too long, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, starts this way. For this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, and it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach, the gent preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. 
I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings, for which you, for which are your glory. You may be seated. Listen, part of the Green family Christmas tradition is the white elephant Christmas game. You've heard of it. It's where everyone brings a gift to the party and you exchange a gift. I don't know how y'all play, but it can be exchanged twice and then it can't be exchanged anymore. I'd like to go on record to say that I despise the game. <laughs> I, I, I hate playing it and maybe your family plays different than mine, but I always leave upset. Because you can only play the game with good gift givers. Come on, somebody. I don't like playing Secret Santa because you can only play the game with good gift givers. And, 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 and the whole point of the white elephant game, at least in my family, is not that you get a good gift. It's just that you get a gift. That's the only rules we have. You just leave with a gift. Well, listen, in, in, in our text today, Paul talks about the ultimate gift, the gift of the gospel, the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus Christ. He even points us towards the ultimate gift giver, our Heavenly Father. And, and it causes my imagination, my spiritual imagination to begin to, to run. You have to excuse my spiritual imagination. It's been influenced by hip-hop culture uh, and, and Oak Cliff and, you know, all of that good stuff. But, but, but I imagine Paul is describing this ultimate gift exchange that happened over 2,000 years ago. And it, it has nothing to do with a white elephant. In fact, it has to do with crimson-stained souls that's been covered and now are as white as snow. Listen, I, 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 I am so glad that I am a recipient of this great gospel. And so for a few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject as of I am gifted. You are gifted. We are gifted. I am gifted. Paul talks about this mystery. He reveals that the mystery has, has been talked about in the Old Testament, but not until the pages of Ephesians 3 do we understand it's been further revealed to the prophets. And now it is this gospel. Paul shows us there are four gifts within the gift, four benefits of the gift. But we have to understand first what the gift is. The gift is just simply Jesus. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that you never leave with feeling like I didn't get a good enough gift. It, it, it's the gift that has, has carried down from generation to generation. It's the gift that doesn't need batteries and is still powerful. And it's the mystery of Jesus. See, all other religions have certain similarities. Whether it's, it's, it's Buddhism or, or it's the, the, the observance of Confucius, what, whatever it is, or, or, or Islam, there's a, there's a head that everybody worships. He's supposed to be the creator and he knows all things. He's supposed to be infinite in wisdom. The problem or the mystery about Christianity is simply Jesus. In no other religion does the God, the head, clothe himself in human flesh, dwell among his people, live, heals, ministers, then dies. No, no, no other leader comes in flesh, dies, is buried, and then rises three days. That's what the problem of the gospel is. That's what people are trying to figure out. That's what the mystery is. That's why it's hard to explain, because it's inexplainable. So one of the first things Paul talks about here in verse 6 is why we are gifted. I am gifted in relationship. The mystery of this gospel is that when Jesus came, he came so that we now not only have salvation, but that we have relationship. And as Paul explains this mystery of the gospel, he has to make up some words to explain it. He, he, the first word he makes up is, verse 6, we are co-heirs. That, that's not a great word. And it just simply means we are heirs together now with our brother Jesus. 
And so when, 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 when the Primerica policy is laid out, our name is right on the Jesus and beneficiaries. We, we are co-heirs with Christ, Romans 8 and 17 says. Colossians 3 and Hebrews 9 talks about our inheritance is heaven. So first Paul says we, we, we are gifted in relationship because we're co-heirs. Then he says we're members in the body. What does that mean? That means that we now have the privilege to be members of the church. The first church with a lowercase c. That's the local church. And then we're members of the universal church with a, a capital C. It just means that we all have a place in the family of God. We all have a place at the local church. And so what that means is we are all members of a body. So if the arm doesn't work, we're not a complete body. If the leg decides not to show up, we're not a complete body. If the toes don't show up, then we can't walk straight. We're all members of the body. So when we come into this place and we don't get involved, and we spectate, and we're not unified, and we don't forgive our brothers, and we don't forgive our sisters, and we don't love them even when they act unlovable, then our body is not complete. And part of our gift is that we're members of this body. So we're co-heirs. Then we're members in the same body. And then it says... We're sharers in the promise. All of us share in one promise. You know he had to make a word up for that. We're all sharers in the promise. Well, what is the promise? The Holy Spirit. And the reason why we share in him, because see, we don't all need him to do the same thing at the same time. See, sometimes I need him, sometimes you need him to comfort you because you're going through. Well, I need him to convict me because I won't shut up. We need them for different reasons at different times. We're sharers in this promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. You know what else we have because we have the Holy Spirit? We all have gifts. Pastor Jefferson said it at the earlier service. We all have at least one spiritual gift. And we all can use that as members in the body. We have this gift of relationship that we ought to use. We, 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 we. We are gifted to be in relationship, and we are not take that lightly. Then verse 7 says we are gifted in service. It, it reads this way. It says, I became servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Some of your versions may say I became slave. And I know at the moment you read slave, you stopped listening because Maya Angelou told you of the hope of the slave and you don't work for free. And so you stop reading past that point. You stop listening. I, I came by to tell you, in, in the New Testament, there, 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 there are words we in the English use as slave and servant, but they mean something different in their original vernacular. They can mean bond servant or they can mean waiter. Bond servant means you are committed to serving one person. Or this term, diakonos, means waiter, which means you have signed up to be at the bid and at the call of your customer. Who is your customer? Jesus Christ. You, you are a servant who has signed up to say, I give my life to you. I'll do your will. I'll do what you want to say. If we had to grade how you serve the Lord, what would your grade be? How, how many times do we say, now, I, I know you're calling me for that, Lord, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm not going to do that yet. I'm not ready. How many times do he tell us to go left and we say, now, send somebody else and I'll see how it goes for them. But God has called us to be at his beck and call and to serve. And in response to this great gospel, in response to this great mystery of Jesus, we ought to want to serve him anyway. A couple of weeks ago, we were celebrating my uncle's birthday at Papa Do's. Me and Landon went, it was my uncle and my aunt, uh, friends of our family, my parents. While we were looking at the menu, I realized, had a revelation, if you are 62 or older, the lunch menu at Papa Do's, you can have them prices all day long. See, that was free, you didn't even come for that, but I just blessed you. <laughs> the second thing I realized is that me and Landon, my son, these two eligible bachelors, are at dinner with everybody at the table who is eligible for the free lunch for seniors. 
And so when I realized that I told the waitress younger, I said, come here, come, come closer. They finna give you the business. Because all of them are over 62. They're going to pay you a good tip, but they finna give you the business. Now, if they handle you or if they give you too much instruction, just let me know. And she responded. She said, no, I'm here to serve. And I prepared for them. That should be our response when God calls us. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the company is. But our response should be, no, I'm here to serve. And if God calls us to it, We've got to know that he's equipped us for it. And so our response should be, I'm, I'm here to serve. So, so we are gifted in relationship. We are gifted in service. Third, we are gifted in stewardship. We're gifted in stewardship. Verse 8 through 11, it says in verse 8, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Goes on to say, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says we are gifted in stewardship and I know the minute you hear stewardship, you think money. And because of your environment that you came up in, because of your hip-hop influences, you think that I'm going to say you need to give my money to the church. This has nothing to do with your little bank account. When he says we are gifted to be good stewards. No, this one has nothing to do with your bank. There's some other scriptures that do, but not this one. This one is saying there is another account that you had. And, and even on your best day, that count was always overdrawn. It was always insufficient funds. And it didn't matter that you started the day with brand new grace and mercy. Every day you ended the day with insufficient funds. And that account was your sin account. Because every day you missed the mark. Every day your tongue gets you in trouble like me. Every day, every day you don't do what's right. Some days you take pens from work and some days you take printer paper from work. Some days you pick up a dollar when somebody drops it. Some days you cheat on your taxes. But all of us end the day with our sin account overdrawn. But I like that Paul doesn't focus on that account. Paul focuses on another account, and he says, the Lord's incalculable, immeasurable riches. Once again, we're not talking about money, but it says there is an account that the Lord has that you have access to. Your name is on the account. Goodness and mercy overflow in that account. Peace overflows in that account. Love and joy are in that account. Forgiveness, grace is in that account and it overflows daily. And so every night when you lay down and say them prayers that you fall asleep on, the Lord transfers grace and mercy from his account and he puts it in your account. He never sleeps or slumber so he doesn't forget to transfer. He, you, there's nothing you can do on that day to say, no, I ain't transferring tomorrow. No, you. But every day he takes from his account then he puts it in your account so that when you open your eyes, crust for your eyes, new grace and new mercy fill your account. And, and, and you know the good thing about it? You can't even go into your account history and see what it looked like yesterday. Why? Because he's wiped that clean. There is no history about what you did on yesterday. So we are gifted to be good stewards. Well, what does that mean? If we know what our account looked like every day, and we know what his account looked like every day, why aren't we telling others about his account? That's what being a good steward is. It's saying, listen, I got a discount. I got a free gift. I got a free reward. Tell somebody else so that they can get it. And, and 
And I think sometimes we stand here as preachers and you hear that we're saying, when you go and tell somebody about the Lord, make sure you walk them through the scriptures. Make sure you know the Romans role. Make sure you can recite it. Make sure, no, no, what we're telling them, what we're telling you to tell them is, tell them about the difference he's made in your life. Tell them the story. Can't nobody else tell them how God turned things around in your life. My, my, my niece asked me one time, Uncle Michael, why do you listen to this song so much? She said, is it your favorite? I said, right now it is my favorite. The song was by Tasha Page Lockhart, and the song was entitled Difference. Yeah. And she talked about how she was a kid and had these big dreams to live for God, but she hit that late teenage and early adult years and strayed away. And now she had got to a point where God had made the difference in her life. She gets to the vamp. I'm not going to sing it for you today, but let, just, just hear me, all right? The, the vamp says, you can see it in how I walk. The difference. You, you can see it in how I talk. The difference. I can see it when I pray. I start to shed some tears each word I say. The difference. Some tell me it's like day and night. Because me, I used to go off quick. I'd cuss and I'd fight. I'm still working on that. Uh, but Jesus has come into my life. He saw my potential and he made it right. It wasn't easy what I went through. But I'm stronger now and now I can help you to be different. You've been gifted to be a good steward. And part of being a good steward is saying this shine campaign that the church is doing, you make it your personal campaign. That you tell the people in your life, you tell the people on your job, you tell the people at the soccer game that the Lord has made a, a difference in my life. L last, and I'll take my seat, the last thing, verse 13, Paul says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. Paul wrote this letter to the church while he was in a Roman jail. He was chained to a guard. Three guards had shifts throughout the day and he was chained to them and he would write to encourage the church at Ephesus and the other prison letters. And he was encouraging them although he looked like he should be discouraged. He, he was uplifting them and pointing them towards Christ. And spectators could have said, but he had been left alone. But what Paul says is look a little closer. Because every time a guard changes shift, I'm sharing with them the gospel. Every time somebody comes to bring his food, he, he's sharing the gospel. Every time he finishes a letter and prepares to give it to somebody to deliver to somebody else, they read about the gospel. And Paul is saying, this suffering that I'm in, it's not about me. It's for you. Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, so if I can go through in a jail, chained to a guard, and tell you that God will see you through, then you in Ephesus can go through whatever you're going through and know that God will see you through. I'm so glad that this is a living word. And it didn't stop right here in the pages of Ephesians, but it traveled generations and centuries and crossed the Atlanta and Atlantic and landed right here in Oak Cliff, Texas so that we could hear the same words that the church at Ephesus heard. The suffering you're going through, don't be discouraged by it because God has something on the other side of it. I know a lot of us, we're okay with being gifted in relationship. We're okay with being gifted in service. We're even okay with being gifted in stewardship, but we're not okay with being gifted in suffering. Because suffering is like walking down a hallway that's dark and you don't know when it ends. Suffering is like signing up for pain without an expiration date. But I came by to tell you, suffering is only temporary. And if you go through it, it's not just for you. It's for somebody, for you to encourage somebody else. Your, your, your misery can become your ministry if you take pride and pain 
and fear and move all of that away and help somebody who's in need of help. Listen, I, I, I feel it in the room. There's some of us who came in here weighed down. We, we, we're carrying a heavy load. There's some of us who don't even really know how we got here today. But you just knew if I put these clothes on and I get there, I could just be counted present. The Lord can say, here, present. Some of us felt like the only reason I came is because I couldn't sit in that room no more. And sit in and grief and sit and wallow and sit and hurt. And I came by to tell you, you came to the right place. And I came by to tell you the load you're carrying, the suffering you're in, the hurt that you feel, somebody else been where you've been. Somebody else can look across the room and tell you, listen, it won't last always. Matter of fact, do I have anybody who can testify? I came out and it didn't last always. Stand to your feet so they can see you today. I came through hurt and I came through sickness and I came through pain and I came through divorce and I just want to testify that God can and God will bring you out. If somebody told you as you're standing, when you were going through, it was for somebody else, would you have believed them? But now on the other side of it, take a look and look at me and say, I'm a witness that God can bring you through. You can take your seat. Listen, so a couple of Christmases ago was the last Christmas. I decided I was going to leave upset. Busted, disgusted, bamboozled, and shysted. And so I got hit to the game. And so for the last couple of years, I've been buying two gifts for the white elephant Christmas party. See, one of the gifts I put into the game. And if I don't get it back, it's okay. I'm going to get a little gift from somebody else. Last year, y'all, I got beef jerky, assortment of beef jerky. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who was responsible for that. Uh, and then I leave the other gift under the tree. So now while I'm playing the game, I'm good. I'm engaged. Oh, y'all, y'all want that? Whatever, whatever. And I keep looking under the tree to make sure that the gift is still there. Because that gift I bought, it was hand-picked for me. It's been waiting for me. Friends, what am I trying to tell you? You have two gifts that God gave you. You are gifted because on this side, you have the grace that surrounds salvation. You hear me? And that doesn't mean every day will be peaches and cream. Some days will be hard, but you've got company and you've got grace and mercy. But whenever this gift gets hard to carry, just keep looking. Just keep looking. There's another gift that's got your name on it. There's another gift that's got you in mind. And that gift is beyond the celestial shore. That gift is the paradise of heaven. And if the other gift gets hard sometimes, just know you got another gift. The old folks will say, I got another building and it's not made by hand. Listen, I don't know about you the last time you got a house built. They say it takes six to nine months. Well, I don't know what kind of building the Lord Jesus is doing because my Bible said he left here 2,000 years ago. And he's been preparing our mansions for over 2,000 years. I came by to tell you, you got a good gift. You are gifted today. Doesn't matter what people have ever said about you. Doesn't matter your present circumstance. Know today that you are gifted in relationship. You are gifted in service. You are gifted in stewardship. You're even gifted in suffering. Come on, let's bless God today. I am gifted.